Hello and welcome to our final class on the book of Philippians. This class is actually a final of finals, as Paul would call himself, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee of Pharisees, so too this class is a final of finals, and here's what that means. This is the last class that we'll have on the book of Philippians, and because of that, we might go a little bit longer than we normally have, but that's okay. Uh, we'll cover the rest of Philippians today. As such, this is also the last class, Lord willing, and our fingers are crossed, that we will be bringing these videos to you. Now, don't misunderstand what that means. What that means is that I will no longer be recording from my office and having the videos posted on Wednesday evenings for us to view for our midweek Bible study. That's because starting November the 4th at 6.30, we are going to be back here at the building. Uh, we're, we're starting back Wednesday nights. There's classes for all ages. We do ask that in classrooms where there's a limited room that you wear a mask just to keep everyone safe. You know, that's what we have to do right now, and that's kind of the way, the way it goes. Uh, but we do ask that you do that. We're going to practice social distancing for the time being, but we're going to be back together again. And what that means is that I will be teaching our Wednesday night class live in person in the auditorium. So what we'll do is we'll go back to doing things the old-fashioned way where we will be a recording in the auditorium and I'll have those posted, Lord willing, on Thursday morning to the best of my ability and there, then you can watch them at your uh, convenience. I know that for several of you who watch these, it, it, you're unable to get out and be with us and, and we're mindful of that, but this is going to require uh, a little bit of a change for us as we try to transition back into doing things live and in person. So this will be the last class that we bring from the office unless something happens or things go wrong or or we have to reevaluate uh, based on numbers but regardless this will probably be the last one that we do now what that means for you as a viewer is if you are unable to come out we love you we're praying for you and we hope that things are going well for you but be on the lookout Thursdays for this video like and subscribe on uh, on uh, YouTube and Facebook and all of that coffee and Christ on Facebook, the Salem Creek Church of Christ Facebook page, Coffee in Christ on YouTube. If you do that, you will get notifications when videos are posted. And so just make sure that, that you have that available to you. We're doing our very best to bring these things to you uh, by means of, of media. And we're thankful that we live in a time where that's available. And so with that, let's get back into our book, closing out with Philippians. We're going to be in chapter 4 and verse 10 and following to the end of the chapter. Now, of course, we need to go back and look at what we saw at the very beginning. Paul is in prison. He calls himself a prisoner of, of Christ. He, he talks about his chains. It's of no mystery that Paul is in prison, I think, in Ephesus, though many would disagree, and say that Paul is in Rome based on his uh, the knowledge being known throughout all the Praetorian Guard. Uh, I, I think that extends even beyond Rome. Uh, but perhaps Paul's in Rome as well. I think he's in Ephesus. Regardless, we know that Paul is in prison, and it seems here that he's awaiting trial. He says, well, I, I don't know whether I'm going to live or whether I'm going to die. I would prefer to go be with the Lord, but I know that for me to live is, is necessary for your sake. And, and so it seems like Paul has a way here that he can manipulate the government, and he can manipulate his trial to go whichever way he wants it to go. And Paul ultimately comes to the decision that he's going to stay around uh, as long as he can because people need his leadership. And the same is true even today. Uh, we have people in our churches that uh, we, we would just, we wouldn't know what to do if they went on to be with the Lord. We would rejoice in their victory and, and being with the Lord, but we would be left so lost because they might be the only one who knows how to do something or, or they might have all the information and, and they might be the leader that we look up to. And that's really what Paul seems here. And Paul goes on to talk about the Christology of Jesus and how he's encouraging the Philippian brethren to be humble, to have this humble attitude, which I think he picks back up on in chapter 4 where we talked about the, uh, the, the, the discourse and the, the tension between uh, Euodia and Syntyche, these two women who seem to be feuding together. But Paul says, humble yourselves, have the mind of Christ in that way. And then as we move into chapter 4, which is where we are now, Paul seems to be drawing on this theme that, hey, you've helped me before, and I've really appreciated that. Maybe you could help me again. Paul is writing this letter. Let's not forget. And again, 
this does not deny the, the, the authority of Scripture. This does not deny the Holy Spirit inspiration of this letter. But Paul is writing this letter for a reason, and I think his reason goes beyond being that kind of apostolic shepherd, if you will, of churches. I think Paul is writing this to get some money, to get some help, because Paul can't do what he needs to do without getting some help. You know, it's like when a missionary comes to our churches and talks about all the things that they're doing in a foreign land. Uh, th their talk is very important, and, and we want to know what they're doing. We want to be in it with them. We want to pray for them and, and love them in that work. But really, they're here for some money, and uh, that's that's not to undershadow or, or overshadow their message, and, and the same is true here. And you pick, pick up on that in chapter 4, as we talked about, but really, you get that in verse 10 and following. When we get to verse 13, of course, this verse has been taken so far out of context by so many uh, about how uh, to live, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, I want you to pay special attention to the passages that surround that verse. So let's begin reading here in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. And I know that stops us right in the middle of a, of a sentence, and uh, we'll pick up with verse 13 in just a moment. But he, this gives us the context for verse 13, which, is, again, has so often been taken out of its context. Now understand, Paul says in verse 10, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, you, you have revived, excuse me, revived your concern for me. So the Philippian church has always been there for Paul. They've always had a love for Paul. They've always wanted to be with Paul. They've always wanted to help Paul. And, and it seems that they still had that love, but they were probably thinking, you know, I don't know that what we're doing is really helping anything. And and how are we going to get money to Paul if he's in Ephesus and or even if he's in Rome? And you know, who can we get to send this? And where are we going to get the money from? And now Paul says, you know, you've always had a love for me. You've always had a concern for me. But now, now that you've read this letter, now that you know my circumstances, namely in chapter 1, now I think you might have revived that great concern for me. You know, it's interesting how often it, it, our minds go where we, we're not really paying attention to the people that are around us until something really bad happens and then our, our love and concern for them is ultimately revived, and, and that's what's happening here, I think. He says, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now, you had this concern, but you didn't know how to give it, and, and you didn't have a chance to give it. And, and Paul, I think you're saying kind of tongue-in-cheek, now I'm giving you the chance. You want to help. You want to do something for me. Now you have the chance. And, and uh, you know, we often talk about praying for opportunities, but then when opportunities come, we wish they hadn't. And I think for Paul here, he's saying, look, you're praying for an opportunity. Your opportunity has come. And then Paul says something that's really interesting. He, he talks about them giving and having an opportunity to give, but then he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need. Now, does that mean that Paul doesn't have a need? No, I don't think so. I think Paul here is in very deep need of some financial help, and or else he wouldn't have mentioned it. And I think that Paul here is is asking in a very humble and, and lowly way for some financial help from the Philippians. But here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, it's not that I need your money in order to be content. It's not that I need anything from you in order to have peace and satisfaction, because all of that comes from the Lord. And, and Paul tells us again, he says, I've learned that in whatever situation I am, to be content. Whatever life throws at us, whatever, what, come what may, I'm going to be content. Now, I, I think too often this verse also gets manipulated because we say, well, you know, you might not have the mansion on a hill, but you've got a good home, and you've got a good vehicle, and you've got a good job, you've got a good family who loves you, and you have every reason to be content. I think that misses Paul's point here. I think Paul's point goes beyond that so as to say whether I have everything or whether I have absolutely nothing, whether I'm being persecuted for the cause of Christ or whether I'm being glorified by the church in, a, in of course, a humble way, 
uh, I can be content. This is possible because this great book, we've themed Joy Ride, that, that joy just seems to overpower the book. But joy is not an emotion, it's not a, it's, it's not an emotional setting. It, it, it's, it's something that comes from within. So I've said it many times. I've said happiness is an influence from an outside force on our emotional state. So if someone brought me a gift, that would make me happy. It's an outside factor uh, on my emotional state. Joy, on the other hand, is an inward state. It's a constant state of being. Therefore, I can, as James says in James chapter 1, rejoice in my tribulations. I, I can, uh, because I'm on a steady diet of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, have that joy and, and that peace that surpasses all understanding. And then Paul says, I know how to be brought low. Now, Paul has been brought low so many times. Uh, Paul is this guy that he never seems to get puffed up. The church might puff him up, but he doesn't seem to get puffed up. But the world brings him low continually because they continue to, to throw him in jail and to beat him and to do things like that. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And Paul's going to tell us that secret here in verse 13. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. So let's take verse 13 here. And not trying to take it out of context again, but based on what's already been said, Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, your Bible may say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think that gets a little interpretive because in Greek, the word Christ is not mentioned. So who is Paul referring to, to here? Who is him? Uh, perhaps it's Christ. Perhaps it's God the Father. Perhaps it's the Spirit. I think the answer is yes, that it goes back to the entire Godhead here being there with Paul, constantly encouraging him. He's praying to them. Paul has the ability to have conversation with them. God calls Paul up in, in 1 Corinthians uh, I believe it is, to the third heaven, he calls it, the things that, that are unspeakable, he can't even put into words. So he knows that he can do all things through him who strengthens me. Here's what this verse means. No matter what life throws at us, if we are firmly planted in Christ, and if our faith and our hope is in Christ, the worst thing that could happen to us is that we go be with him. It's the worst thing that could happen to us. Here's what this verse does not mean. This verse does not mean that you can win a football game. This verse does not mean that that you can go through a, 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 a demotion at work. Though I think that God is with us in our endeavors, this verse goes far beyond that. And it's a tragic misrepresentation when we take a verse and put it on a locker room in a school. It makes me physically sick to think that someone did that with a Bible verse. And then Paul gets back to kind of his, uh, his laying it on thick to the Philippians. He says, it was kind of you to share in my trouble. Well, yeah, it was kind of them. Uh, you, you know, when we go around to churches and we ask for things like sponsorships. And, and, and you know, I, I kind of align with Paul here because uh, the, the church here at Salem Creek has helped me out quite a bit from my undergraduate now to my doctoral level of study and uh, in, in the financial way. And and I hope that the church sees that as being valuable for them. And I think that's what Paul's getting at here. You know, it was kind of you to share my trouble. It was kind of you to think of me uh, because I think that you think this is coming back for your own good. And Paul references what they've done historically. Now, isn't that the way asking for something goes? That if you want something, you go to that person and you tell them, hey, remember when? Remember when you did this for me? And Paul says, you Philippians yourselves know that, at the, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Now notice here Paul says in giving and receiving. It's not so much that they're just constantly giving, 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 giving. Here's what they're receiving back from Paul. They're receiving guidance. They're receiving love. They're receiving a, a partnership, as Paul calls it. Now notice here he says, no church entered into partnership with me. 
Now, the term partnership here is, is pretty loaded. On the one hand, it can mean fellowship, like we talk about having a fellowship meal or being in fellowship with one another. But when you look at it from a first century standpoint of a Greco-Roman society and what it meant to be a partner in that particular context, here's what it meant. It's like two people jumping off of a boat in the middle of an ocean with no life jacket and the boat driving away. You are in it together for better or worse. Now today, if you enter into a partnership with someone and you want to break the partnership, someone buys the other person out and you know, usually no hard feelings because I, I didn't want to be in partnership or, or maybe you have a falling out and you can leave. That's not the way it is in the first century. In the first century, if, you, if there was a partnership, it was full scent. Everything, 100%. And that's what Paul says here. You Philippians gave 100% in your partnership with me. No other church would, but you did. Well, let's keep reading in verse 16. Even in Thessalonica, you sent, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Now there's a lot here drawing on sacrificial imagery, and we'll take just a moment to talk about that when we get there. But notice what Paul says in verse 16, even in Thessalonica you sent, you sent me help for my needs once and again. It's not just that Paul has been in prison in Ephesus or Rome or wherever you want to say he's in prison and that this is like the granddaddy of his trials and imprisonments. No, Paul went through trials in Thessalonica and the Philippians were there to provide for him just the same as they are now. But Paul says here, I'm not seeking your gift. And I think that what Paul is saying here is still laying it on thick on the one hand, but on the other hand, I think Paul is saying, it's not so much you're giving the gift that I want. I want to know that you're really in the partnership that you claim to be in. And it's going to count to your credit. What you're doing for me is actually going to do more for you than it does for me. And I think that Paul's use of that here is not really manipulative, but I think Paul knows what he's doing. I think Paul knows what he's saying. He says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Look, I'm not looking for your gift. I'm not looking, I'm not coming to you constantly asking you to do this for me just for the sake of you getting to do it. When you do this, when, when we help each other, when we love each other, we bring each other in, we do those things. God takes notice. When we help the missionary, who has nothing. God takes notice. One thing that's happened here recently in, in churches, I'm not speaking just of Salem Creek or of Salem Creek at all, I'm speaking of churches in the United States, really. With things like coronavirus pandemic and, and uh, adding on to buildings or building new buildings and uh, getting new staff and things like that, one, one of the first things that goes in the budget is helping out good works. Now, that's not to say that we don't have to sacrifice some things in order to, to promote what we're doing. That, that's true because we have a priority to ourselves, and that's true. That's fine. But, friends, I wonder if there are some things that we could sacrifice that aren't being used for the glory of God. And that we could kind of reshuffle some things to our missionary friends who are in these foreign lands or even domestically preaching the cause of Christ. I, I think what Paul says here doesn't need to go unnoticed, that when we give, and we give freely, and we give to these good works, that it increases our credit. Now, Paul says again, I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. So they've already sent a gift. Paul's received them, and he's very thankful for them. And he, here's what he calls the gifts. He says it's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, that should really draw on some Old Testament themes because unlike the gods of ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia who are literally fed by their sacrifice, the, the meat stays on the altar and is, it rots and, and it's the, the gods are said to feed on that, that humans are needed to take care of the physical needs of the gods. Yahweh God never does that. Here's what he says. He says, offer this up to me as a fragrant aroma as a perfume to me. 
God doesn't need us to feed him or to give him drink, but God wants that uh, that fragrant environment. You know, just the other day, I got an air freshener for my truck, and I plugged that thing in, and man, when I get in the truck now, it smells so good, and you almost hate to get out of the truck because it that, that presence there just smells so good. That's what this gift was. It's a fragrant aroma. It's a fragrant offering. A sacrifice. And it is a sacrifice. A sacrifice is literally having to give up of your best. And so the Philippian church here is giving up of their finances. They're giving up of their means to help out the Apostle Paul in his imprisonment. And this is said to be pleasing to God. Of course it would be pleasing to God. Because self-sacrifice is the ultimate form of love. Let's conclude here verse 19 through 23. Paul says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So let's start back in verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Now, based on what we've just read in verses 16 through 18, we see here that Paul has been talking about receiving his needs and the Philippians sacrificing what they have to give to Paul. And Paul says, look, God's not going to leave you alone in this. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches. Well, how rich is God? Listen, God owns everything. God owns everything. If we have that mentality, maybe when we read passages like uh, where the, the, the lawyer brings the coin to Jesus and, and he says, uh, should, we rent, should we pay taxes? Should, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus says, Who's, whose image is on this coin? They answer Caesar's. And he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God what is God's. And we often use that verse as a proof text for church, separation of church and state. You know, I'll give to the government what they require, and I'll give to God what God requires. But God requires everything. When Jesus says, render unto God what is God's, he's talking there too about the money, about our service to the government, because everything belongs to God. How rich is God? God is the richest being. Everything was created by him, through him, and for him. And not only him, but Jesus Christ also. It comes from Colossians chapter 1. And then Paul says, To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's usually how Paul ends his letters, is with a doxology to God. Glory and honor be to God our Father. And then Paul says, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Now, who is a saint? A saint is one who's been sanctified, a member of the church, one who has received salvation, through baptism uh, and uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's that's who a saint is. You don't you don't go die and be anointed a saint. God anoints you a saint at your baptism. He says, "All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household." Now, if Paul is in prison in Ephesus, how does he know Caesar's household? Well, he's already referred to the Praetorians, the Praetorian Guard. Perhaps the Praetorian Guard there is in communication with Paul about Caesar's household, and maybe they say that the gospel is reaching Rome. And you know, when Paul writes his letter to the Romans, Paul had not yet been to Rome, and so uh, perhaps the gospel spreading there, even I think here to the to the household of Caesar. And then Paul ends by saying, "The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit." If there ever was a, a great way to conclude a letter, it would be that. Because I think the Philippians here, you know, the book of Philippians has often been called a book that has really uh, no problem. It's, it's not a problem book. I think we find three problems here, as a matter of fact. The first is of the feud between the two women. Uh, in, in Philippians chapter 4. The second is of disunity, as Paul says in chapter 2, have this mind about you, have this humble mind about you that was the same in Christ Jesus. And lastly here, I think there's a bit of unrest because of what's happened to Paul. And if it could happen to the Apostle Paul, it could happen to any of us. And, and so Paul doesn't just say, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He says, be with your spirit. There's a need for calming and peace in the presence of God in the midst of trial and turmoil. And I think today as we live in the midst of a pandemic, as we live in the midst of social unrest, an election coming up, uh, all of these things that get people worried, may the grace of Jesus Christ be with your spirit 
as well. I've enjoyed our study of Philippians. I really hope you've learned something. I hope this has challenged you to think about the text and the setting and the words of Scripture in not so much a different way, but perhaps in a new way. I hope that you have a great day. I look forward to seeing you and to being with you. And by the way, on November 4th, we're going to spend the first couple of minutes addressing any questions that you have over Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians. Since we haven't been together, we'll get the chance to do that. And if there are no questions, we'll go right in to an introduction to Philemon. We'll spend a couple of weeks on Philemon, uh, perhaps even to, to uh, throughout the whole of November but we'll, uh, we'll just see where we get. I've really enjoyed this. I hope you have as well. God bless. We'll see you on November 4th.